Let's see, I've got to get to full screen. Chapter 9, The Mesmerist and Sammy. Me and the preacher walked through a patch of woods toward the sounds that were cutting through the night air. When we stepped into the Atlas clearing, it was like we'd fell off a cliff into a whole nother world. What I saw was so shocking. It was so shocking that the first, every, at first, everything on me acted like it wanted to drop and squeeze together. The same way your body does if you're walking across some ice that gives way and dumps you into the frozed up winter water. It was like it was too much coming at you all at once. Like it would steal your breathing away from you. But I think that's what the carnival folks were trying to do. Everything in the Atlas clearing was set up to get your head started whirling and keep it going that way, and there were no hiding from none of it. Every part of my body was trying to grab attention away from the next part. My ears were steady picking up sounds that I had never heard nowhere else. There were hoops and hollers from children and grown folks both. Screams that you had you thinking someone was t looking death right in the throat, but that quick turn to laughs that were kind of shame sounding. There was a powerful hissing music and whistling from a wagon that was throwing up fog and songs out of a row of pipes, sounding so hot and hard and pointy that you'd have thought it took a knife. It was scratching at something deep inside your ear. But as soon as it felt like the sounds were going to cause your head to bust open, your eyes started taking over and noticing separate things out of what at first didn't appear to be nothing but a blur of color and torches. There were more than walking stick holding straw hat wearing white men singing out for you to come see what they had hid up in their tents. They kept calling out the same words over and over, sounding like the choir on Sunday, but without no real feeling of happiness in the words. There were bright red and blue and green and yellow banners strung up alongside dull, brown, high-reaching tents. On the banners were pictures of things that you had to pay a whole nickel to go in and get a look at. Why, terrible as those pictures were, I'd have paid a nickel not to go in and see them. There was a painting of a white man that appeared to be half human and half an alligator joined up so as you couldn't tell if what you were seeing was the rear half of an alligator swallowing up the top half of a man, or if it was a man that had been born without no legs who had sewed the back half of a lizard onto himself to see if maybe he could do some walking that way. There was a picture of a white woman that looked like she had some child's arms and legs poking out of the side of her neck. And another white man that was picking up full -grown, a full-grown elephant and holding it over his head like he was about to toss it into the next county. Another banner showed a white man that was wide as a barn, holding hands with a white woman that wore much more than a stick with a hank of yellow hair on top. They were standing under a big red heart that said, Bizarre Love. But the drawing that I, I know that would keep me awake at nights and discourage me from wandering around in the woods for a good long time was the one of a white man who had to be a conjurer. He didn't have no animal parts stuck on him, nor no other parts of people growing out of him that would invite staring. He had something worse, something that I tried hard to look away from, but there no way I could do it. He had sharp, yellow, jaggedy-looking bolts of lightning shooting direct out of his eyes. The bolts were making the normal-looking white man in the picture with him float off his feet and scramble and scratch at the air. Come on. Like he's about to go off in the clouds. It would cost you a whole quarter of American dollar to go in the tent with the conjurer to do this, watch a conjurer do this. I'd have gave two quarters of a dollar not to. I'm mean, sure shooting. This was the other person the preacher said we were going to have to go see. He pointed at the drawing of the man with the lightning bolt eye and said, he's the owner of the carnival. I want to get a look at what kind of rigmarole he's got going before I talk to him. Another straw hat wearing, walking stick waving white man was out front of the tent calling, Last show of the evening! Last show of the year! Last time in Canada! The last chance of your lifetime to see the fantastic Varno working his powers of mental prestidigitation. The preacher slapped two whole American quarters on the table and told the white woman sitting there, 
me and my boy want to go in and see the, the mesmerist. I spoke right up and said, no, sir, you go on in and see him. I'll wait over, over yon by that tree. The preacher grabbed hold of my collar and pulled me into the tent. This one didn't have no benches in to sit down on, so we were standing shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of folks from Chatham. Soon as we were inside and worked our way up to the front, I clamped my hand across my eyes. The preacher put his mouth near my ear and said, no, sir, Bob, I paid a whole 25 cents for you to watch this, and that's just what you're going to do. He jerked my hand away from covering my face. The first thing I did was look straight up, partly so as I wouldn't have to see the stage, but mostly because if the preacher was going to force me to watch and get floated off by lightning coming out of some white man's eyes, I wanted to see if there was something I could latch a hold on to before I ended up in the clouds. If I was going to get lifted away, this was a good place to do it because I couldn't have got no higher than the roof of the tent. There were torches high up on the walls that I'd have to be careful of whilst I was floating. But I figured if I kept a keen eye and kicked at them, I could get by without burning nothing besides my brogans and maybe the cuffs of my trousers. I looked all across the top of the tent and my heart started slowing down. It was a true relief to see that there weren't no one from the earlier shows still stuck up there. Maybe that meant that the conjuring wore off after a while and you'd come a crashing back down. If I'd have known this was going to happen, I'd have brung me a length of rope and tied it around my ankle. That way, if I started floating, the preacher could have pulled me along home like a kite. I'd have felt a lot better about waiting for the conjuring to wear off back in Buxton than here amongst a bunch of strangers. Before I could do any more worrying, the curtain on the, a curtain on the stage got whipped aside and a tall, round white man in a long black cape was standing right in front of us. His eyes looked a whole lot more like a dead person's eyes than a live person's. They were blank and blue, and they appeared to be looking square at you, but you could tell they weren't really seeing a thing. A bevy of laughs and moans and screams came out of everyone that was jammed up in the tent. It ain't being fragile when I say that I was amongst the screamers. I grabbed a hold of the preacher's shirt sleeve and mashed my face into it. He was just as quick, snatched it away and said, I told you you were going to watch this. You can learn about how flim flam works. I noticed my own arm was being held on too tight and looked to see who'd grabbed me. A little white stranger boy near about as old as me was laughing and carrying on something wild. He swore. Blang it all. This is the fourth time I seen him and I still near about jump out of my skin when he first come on stage. He talked like he was from America. I said, you saw him four times? Ain't you afraid of getting floated off? He laughed and said, pshaw, he just an old humbug. He can't float not nowhere. The boy had a head of thick curly red hair and a nose that looked a whole lot like a bird's beak. His eyes were a scary gray blue color, about the same as the sky for a storm. He wore nothing but a child, but the smell of cigar smoke came out of his mouth strong. I said, he really can't float nothing away? Now nah, watch what happens. What's your name? I'm Elijah. The boy looked like I cursed at him. Elijah, you sure? Of course I'm sure. You live down in Buxton? Yes. Well, I'm gonna tell you something, Elijah. You best not tell no one from Chatham that's your name. Why not? Cause there's a rap scallion in chatting what's already laid claim to that name and he ain't the kind to be sharing nothing with no one there was a boy up here whose name was edward and elijah from chatton didn't want no, didn't want no one else having their name even start with the same first letter as his so he made the boy change his name to oddward and oddward's own ma and pa calls him that now because they didn't want no trouble with the real elijah if i was you i'd find me another name because Elijah from Chatham ain't going to be real happy about meeting you, particularly not with you being a slave boy from Buxton. I won't never a slave. I won't never a slave. I was freeborn. Don't matter. Just you might be, be mindful of who, who you say that name to. Elijah from Chatham ain't to be trifled with. You already killed a full-grown Indian man and didn't kill him with no knife or gun or sword. Killed him with one hand, his left one. And he ain't but 12 years old. 
Those words hadn't, hadn't had no chance to sink in good when the conjurer on stage came to life. He flung his arms to the sides and showed that under his black cape he was wearing something blue that looked a powerful lot like a dress with all sorts of shiny sparkling, silvered stars and crescent moons. Why, it was pasted with as many moons as stars. And that don't make no sense. That don't make no sense at all. All the folks that were screaming and laughing a minute ago set up a mass of oohs and ahs that would have had you believing they were seeing the real heavens instead of a dress with a sham stars and way too many moons stuck all over it. The little white boy dug his elbow into my ribs and said, keep a watch on his eyes. The most amazing thing happened. The conjurer's eyes rolled back in his head and in their place to, it was took right away by another set of eyes. Only difference twixt them was that these two eyes were brown, and whilst the other ones seemed staring and empty, these eyes were looking dead at you. And worst, well, no doubt that they were seeing you. I felt my legs commence shaking and grabbed a hold of the white boy so as I wouldn't fall. He said, them first eyes is painted on his lids. I was out back smoking a cigar with him and seen it myself. He ain't real at all. The conjurer was slow as anything, peering hard at everyone in the crowd. When his eyes hit him, some folks screamed, some folks laughed, some folks cried, and some folks appeared to be dumbstruck. I ain't sure which group I was amongst because the fear in me was so was too strong. The white boy said, watch this, I'm gonna have me some fun here. When the man's eyes struck him, the boy stood bolt upright and his face froze stiff as a stone. I quick unloosed his arm so as the conjurization wouldn't have the chance to jump off of him and onto me. The man pointed spot on at the boy and, and called out, You! The boy's eyes near bucked right out of his head. The conjure man. The conjure man's finger commenced crooking and bending in a way that got more screams and confusion to rise up from the crowd. The boy looked at me, his face unfroze for a second, and one of his gray eyes winked. Then quick as anything, his face froze up again, looking all stupefied, and he started pushing his way through the people and heading to, to the steps on the side of the stage. You'd have thought the conjurer's finger was a magnet, and the boy was made out of iron filings. But when folks saw the spell he was under, they stepped aside like he was toting a bucket of that, of, that was overflowing with the plague. He got up on the stage and the conjurer waved his cape over the boy's head twice. He said, boy, do you know me? The boy said, no, sir, you's the perfect stranger. Then we've never spoken? No, sir, and I ain't never smoked no cigar with you behind the tent, neither. Some folks that didn't know how frightsome this was laughed and the conjurer screamed out, silence! Do you not see that this boy is already under a spell and talking nonsense? Why? If I were to misdirect my attention away from him for merely one moment, he'd be in danger of remind, remaining a babbling idiot like this for the rest of his life. The conjure man talked like he came from England. Most folks got quiet like they were in church. The conjure waved his cape over the boy's head and again and said, look into my eyes, look deeply into my eyes. The boy couldn't help himself. He looked and the conjurer started blinking first one eye, then the other. So as on one side of his face, you were seeing a live brown eye and the other side, you were seeing a dead blue one. Then he opened both dead eyes at once. And then both live ones till by and by your head was back to whirling and you know this boy had been wrong. This conjurer was real. I snatched back a hold of the preacher's coat sleeve. The conjurer said, look even more deeply into my eyes. The boy's head started going back and forth as fast like a pendulum and a clock that the weights fell off. Then his chin dropped down on his chest and appeared he was out cold, except in, he didn't fall in a heap. The man said, you are entering a realm of velvet sleep, golden slumbers and dappled dreams. Once I snap my fingers, you will lose yourself in my voice. Upon the sound of my fingers snapping, my simplest wish will become your irresistible command. He slow raised his right hand over his head, waited what felt was like an hour. Then he snapped his fingers 
At the same exact time, someone banged a drum, one terrible boom, and a flash of red and yellow powder exploded and popped and hissed all along the front of the stage. Screams and smoke from the powder rised up from the top to the top of the tent, and truth told, my scream was amongst the loudest and longest lasting. The conjurer said, when I count to three, you will open your eyes and hear no other voice than mine. One, two, three. He snapped his fingers again and the boy's eyes came open and were staring direct at the conjurer. I know the poor boy was under the man's spell because one of his eyeballs started looking right whilst the other one was looking left. Then they commenced to go into circles and roll him back in his head. My blood ran cold thinking how this boy had thought of this was all a flim flam and now he'd gone and let this ter horrible looking man snatch a hold of his soul. I know it won't going to be long before this poor white boy would be scratching and clawing at the roof of the tent. The conjurer said, what is your name, boy? The boy started talking slow, having a hard time getting the words out. M my, my name, me, Samuel, but most folks calls me Sammy. Samuel, who is the only person in the entire world whom you can trust. You, master, that's right. And do you believe everything I say? Like your mouth's a prayer book, master. Then why are you speaking to me in English? You are not a little boy. You are a chicken. And unless chickens in Canada are very much brighter than American chickens, they do not speak English. It was a most amazing thing. Little boy started clucking and pecking around on stage. Then he commenced scratching at the floor with his bare feet. And you'd have swore he was digging up worms. Near everybody in the tent acted like this was something funny. None of them thought to worry what Sammy's ma was going to say when, she, when the son she sent to the carnival as a little boy came home as a giant bird. And even worse, a giant chicken. The conjurer waved his cape again and called out, You are no longer a chicken. You're a boy again, but wait, the weather has changed. It's positively freezing in here. Why, the boy took to shivering and teeth chattering and knee knocking so doggone much that I felt the chill of coldness run down my back. And this warn't no flim flam neither, cause Sammy started turning blue the way they say white people do when they're dead or just about ready to die. The mesmerist yelled, egad, this Canadian weather. One second it's freezing, and the next it's like the fires of Hades. The, this heat is enough to kill. Sammy quit shivering and commenced to wiping his brow and pulling at the collar of his shirt and saying, Phew! So as you'd have thought he'd have just gotten done plowing 50 acres in the middle of July with a mouse for a mule harnessed to a knife for a plow. The folks laughed and screamed so much that you could see why this cost a whole quarter of American dollar to come in and see. The mesmerist said, and what's that I see in fr right in front of you, young Samuel? It appears to be the waters of Lake Erie, cool and deep and inviting. Sammy started brushing at the stage like it was covered with sand. He was clearing a spot to spread a blanket. But before he could set himself down, the mesmerist said with a voice that was fooled up with disappointment, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. Sammy froze up and the man told him, how can you even think of relaxing at the seashore when you are just a very few feet away from bathing in this great lake's waters? You should jump right in. Sammy slapped his own forehead like he was thinking, how come I didn't think of that? And stuck one of his toes out to test the water. He let out a long, ah, and, and got ready to put his whole foot in the lake that couldn't no one but him and the conjure man see. Before even his ankles got wet, the mesmerist said, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. Sammy didn't step no farther into the water, and the conjurer looked at all of us who were watching and said, Have any of you here ever heard of a boy going in to bathe fully clothed? The crowd shouted out in one throat, No! I kept my eye on Sammy, and for a second, the dumbstruck look flew off his face and his brow wrinkled, but just as quick, he went back to looking stupefied. The mesmerist said, of course not, particularly not when you are wearing the finest silk shirt that the most talented tailor in Toronto has to offer. Samuel, your mother would be appalled if you were to get that beautiful 
expensive and rather stylish shirt wet. Sammy slapped his forehead again and started pulling the shirt over his head. Once he had it off, he wasn't wearing nothing but a raggedy undershirt and commenced to tiptoeing back into the lake. But before the water could cover even his knees, the mesmerist said it again. Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. Sammy stopped uh, with one foot in the air and looked back at the conjurer. My word, ladies and gentlemen, would you look at this young man? He is stubborn and ungrateful lad. Not only has his dear beloved mother seen fit to clothe him in a fine silken shirt, she's also given him a silk undershirt. Please, Samuel, off with it before it's ruined by the waters of Lake Erie. This time, Sammy cut a look at the mesmerists that weren't the least bit dumbstruck. He was kind of edging on him being worried. He pulled his undershirt over his head and a bale of lass echoed round this tent. Laughing is a peculiar thing, because there's lots of different kinds. There's the laughing you do at the end of a good story. The laugh you give when you're scared, then you find out you didn't have no cause to be. And the laughing that was bouncing around this tent. It wore not a happy kind of sound at all. It mostly reminded me of the cutting sounds that a pack of hounds makes once they commence to rip an opossum to shreds. It was more like the sound you'd think the devil would make if he had a good sense of humor and you told him a joke. I weren't doing none of the kinds of laughing. I could see that if this started out being fun for Sammy, it sure was turning into something else. Ma and Pa must be right about what smoking does to a child, because once his undershirt was off, we could see Sammy was right skinny and sickly looking. And though standing in front of all these people without no kind of shirt on at all would have shamed me near to death, the conjurization was on him so strong that Sammy kept on doing it. But it did seem like his enthusiasm for the whole show was getting littler and littler. He hugged his arms around himself and started back to tiptoeing into Lake Erie. But Sammy gave a long, pulled out groan when the mesmerist and most of the folks in the crowd moaned out, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. A hoop and a holler came out of the crowd because we were all pretty sure that even though Sammy's trousers looked old and worn out, looked like old and worn out dungarees to us, to the mesmerists, they were going to be some more of that fine Toronto silk that can't stand getting wet. Egads, boy, I've never seen such a privileged yet undeserving child. Your mother's love for you knows no bounds. Silken trousers as well. Can you believe it? This time the stupefied look left Sammy, and a feardness and shaming took over. The red from his hair started leaking down onto the rest of his face. His ears started glowing up like hot pokers. But he turned his back to the crowd and started unbuttoning those trousers. He held up once they were all unbuttoned, but the mesmers had no mercy in him at all. He waved his cape and said, off with the silken trousers. Sammy gave a gulp so loud everyone in the tent heard it. Then he let loose of his pants and they dropped right round his ankles. The crowd. The crowd sucked in air and it got real quiet except for one man who hollered out, Shucks, if his darn ma loved him so darn much, you'd think she'd have bought the boy some kind of underdrawers, silk or not. The laughs and howls and hoots must have raised the roof of the tent five feet, all because Sammy was naked as the day he was born, and he turned red as any cardinal I'd ever seen. I'd rather got floated to the ceiling for two hours than to stand there like that for two seconds. The mesmerist's mouth flew open, and he quick clopped Sammy in the head, then pulled his cape around him and said, The spell's over. Pull your pants up, you little chatterhead. Have you lost your blasted mind? After they rough-handed Sammy and booted him out of the tent, the conjurer mesmerized two or three other folks, but one, none of them nowhere near as inter interesting as Sammy. It must have been getting near midnight when me and the preacher left the tent, and he said, when we get to this next place, just go along with everything I say and fight the urge of yours to talk so much. Don't you open your mouth unless you're spoken to. Yes, sir. We walked a little ways into the woods and sat on a couple of stumps whilst folks cleared out of the carnival. Finally, the preacher said, let's go. And remember, the less you say, the better. And that brings us to chapter 10, meeting the real Maui.